This video is on the geometry of the proton and why you should really care about the proton. And this is why. Because all of life, which includes you, and all of matter, which includes everything that you can see, it's all possible because of the unique geometry of the proton. And that's because everything, including yourself, is built on molecules. And if we break this down further, let's get a picture of one molecule and how the proton plays a role. So molecules can be formed by sharing electrons, separating a distance between a proton and an electron in what's called an orbital. And because of that distance, uh, another atom, another proton, can share that electron. And that's what allows molecules to form because of that distance. And following that logic, again, that allows molecules and the creation of all matter. So therefore, the proton has a unique geometry that allows the creation of matter. But the reason why it's unique is I'm going to explain another positively charged particle that destroys matter. Right? The exact same charge as the proton, but this is what happens with an electron. Poof! And matter seemingly disappears in a process known as matter-antimatter -matter annihilation. But fortunately for humankind, the proton structure allows the creation of atoms and matter, as I just explained. So what is the difference, then, for those two positively charged particles? What makes the proton unique and allows matter and, and life to form? So we're going to explain this with waves. And this is going to be a recap of in waves and, and out waves from previous works. So well, I'm going to go through this quickly, but there'll be a reference URL if you need more details. Um, but we're going to add on a layer here. And thanks to Chris Seeley and, and Terrence Howard, because uh, it's now computer simulated. I'm going to show some of those in upcoming slides. But Planck length and, and fine structure constant you see there. Um, and the information, if you, anyone wants to follow along the math, uh, there is the URL, but I'm going to make it easy to click uh, in the description. But without a lot of math uh, in this description, I'm going to explain how particles can be formed as standing waves, right? standing longitudinal waves. And beyond those standing waves, those waves are still traveling, and, and eventually waves have a force on a different particle, and we know that as the electric force. And waves that travel in a different form, which is transverse, um, due to the spin of the particle, we see as magnetism, so the magnetic force. And in previous work, that electron's magnetic moment was uh, derived, and here is a force of a monopole. All right, so particles, standing waves, and the forces, traveling waves, and really just two different types of waves, longitudinal and transverse. Now, one more thing as a recap before we start to get into uh, the difference between the positron and the proton is this. A standing wave is actually unique, right? Standing wave is stored energy. There's no net propagation of energy, but there is energy come in waves and also from out waves. But there's a special property called the nodes where zero, there's zero amplitude, and that means no displacement. Basically, it's not moving. So that is the absolute perfect place, stable place, if a particle can, can reach what's called the node. Another feature about this, in a standing wavelength, there are only two nodes per wavelength. And so we're just going to arbitrarily call these negative and positive. And this is why. Because uh, two particles at opposite uh, nodes, that's a 180 degree phase uh, shift on the wave, uh, is destructive. The same thing happens, uh, for example, in noise cancellation headsets. That's how it works. Is destructive wave interference. And so with destructive wave interference between two particles that are placed on opposite nodes, it would be attractive like this. And the opposite would occur for particles that are on the same node, and it would be constructive, uh, forcing them away. But in this case, we're taking a look at the positron. Right? An electron and a positron are fully destructive waves now, which also means that the standing waves don't form. There are no waves for standing waves, so therefore there is no energy to be measured as matter. And as a result, it looks like uh, matter is completely destroyed in this process. Let's do this. Let's imagine now that we can separate that electron and positron, and that is stable. Right? This is not a real scenario, but let's just imagine if it could happen. 
it would form the simplest dipole magnet. I've changed the icons here now to see the spin uh, because uh, using the monopole force earlier, this now becomes the two particles a dipole. And so there's an equation for the force of a dipole magnet, and you also see uh, the dom denominator there is an r cubed, and that follows the what we see with static magnets, which is the force um, reduces at the at the cube of distance. Okay, but as I mentioned, that scenario is not possible, right? An electron and a positron seemingly vanish, disappear, matter disappears. So there is something different about the proton which has the same charge. What is it? All right, let's take that same concept from earlier where the electron and positron found a position really close to each other at standing wave nodes. But in the case of two electrons, it would take a considerable amount of energy uh, because of the constructive wave interference. Well, let's just say you had enough energy to push them together until the points where they were in, within each other's sphere of standing waves, and they were able to reach that node. But two wouldn't be enough because of this. Right? It has to be a three-dimensional structure. Now, those circles here uh, illustrate wavelengths. Right? Now, at wavelengths, Again, there you find the uh, nodes of standing waves. So if it is close enough within standing waves, now you have to look at the intersection. Look really closely at the intersection of those circles. It has to be at a wavelength from each and every one of these particles. And this formation as a tetrahedron allows that to happen, where each one of these particles actually could be at a wavelength within standing waves. Okay. Now, that is a proton, because a proton is known as a composite particle, meaning that there's two or more particles, at least, uh, within the um, proton, and its components are bound by the strong force. You can see that as the red line that I have just drawn, and the equation, therefore, the strong force. If you actually follow the math from earlier into the equations, you'll see that it is 137 times stronger than the electric force, which is the fine structure constant. Anyway, but this only occurs, that force only occurs when it can reach the, within those standing wave radius, which means it is quite short that it occurs. It only occurs at nodes, standing wave nodes, and furthermore, it's using so much energy now that those particles actually uh, are not reflecting out waves, and th therefore there's no electric force to be detected from these, these particles. But the proton still has an electric force that is positive, right? So we're going to take this a step further. We're going to assume that the geometry of the proton has a positive charge, and let's assume that that positive uh, charge is the pro a positron, and it's captured in the center. Right? It would match experiments, because it would be a composite particle, yes, check, and its components might be detected as three high-energy quarks. Remember, they have significant energy. Two of those particles are destructive and cannot be detected. It also would also match this, right? With more energy, all of its components could be separated, and that would be known as the pentaquark. And a pentaquark, you know, found within the last decade, is a particle with four particles and an antiparticle. So check, it matches that as well for the, this geometry. And so thanks to Chris Seeley, uh, we've gone ahead and have simulated this now with four spheres, uh, that arrangement, a tetrahedron, and you do see a, another structure there in the middle, uh, which is multicolored, uh, blue, uh, blue, green, and red. Um, it's not perfectly spherical because we're also modeling some magnetism, which I will explain on this next page. But there you see the structure. And those vortices there are, are meant to do this, showing that dipole alignment. So if you look at the center here. Uh, positron, electron, you have the same dipole magnet that we were discussing earlier. So let's consider that a force now, forcing an electron out, but of course a positron and electron also as shown earlier is attractive too. So imagine competing forces, one pushing it out, the other pulling it in. So it's both attracted and repelled, and if you solve for those equations, the magnetic and electric equations, you use the sum of forces rule, and it solves for what is known as hydrogen's orbital. It's called the Bohr radius. 
Now, the electron would actually be pushed and pulled, right? Because the, the uh, alignment, the repelling force is only at the dipole alignment. It's always uh, attracted, but pushed out only at those alignments as the proton is spinning. And so it results in a probability cloud. Now this is what it would look like computer animated. Now this is not to scale because the proton is blown up, but you can see this little squirrely lines there is showing the, the vortices of where the alignment between the positron in the center and the electrons would appear. So at those alignments is when the electron would be forced out. And so it's that dipole alignment that is unique about the proton. It allows the electron to be forced out into an orbital and then allow it to be shared with other protons and atoms, creating molecules that create matter and, and life. And that is it. That's what makes the proton unique. But there's more about the geometry, and let's visit this now. At the core of the proton, uh, four particles at the uh, vertices of tetrahedron, you'll notice that there's a smaller tetrahedron that forms. But because of the spherical nature of it, uh, see there in yellow, is a curve tetrahedron. And we're going to refer to that as a tetrahedron. There it is right there in yellow. Now the reason why that could be helpful is this, atomic nuclei, right? Atoms form as a combination of protons and neutrons, and neutrons are also a composite particle, almost identical to a proton in structure, but just neutral. And nuclei are normally modeled as spherical particles, but now imagine this. Let's run that computer simulation, thanks to Terence Howard. See that tetrion, and now different formations of tetrion, so, you know, spherical particles would still need to be in place um, but just imagine now this being the core, and you can envision different atomic nuclei. There is another stable tetrahedron with something in the middle. So this could very well help us to model what uh, would atomic nuclei look like and why certain nuclei are more stable than others. So with that, I'd like to give thanks again to Terence Howard and Chris Seeley for the animations and simulations here. And for more information, there's the URL. Thank you and have a great day.